And so we're, we've got these chapters in between, and I'm not going to rehash them because there's just too much material in them, but I am going to go back and pick up a little bit. Uh, people say that history repeats itself. Other people says that we learn from other people's mistakes or their experiences. And other people will say they just never seem to learn from history or from mistakes given. And we finding that in this lesson uh, in Kings, as we're looking at all these different kings and so forth, and I don't know, but I really believe with my whole heart that God gave Israel that land. He miraculously led Joshua across. They conquered that land. He said, I'm going to give you a land flowing with milk and honey. I'm going to give you cities that you didn't even build. You just move in, possess it, and worship me. And if you fail to do that, then he said, if you break that covenant with me, then you are going to suffer my punishment. And then I think about United States of America. And I don't know, I'm a firm believer that God gave Christians in the age of grace the United States of America because they came over being persecuted and they wanted to set up. And if you do any past history, every one of our universities, Yale, Harvard, you name them, they were built on the foundation of the Bible. They taught the Bible. Uh, and all the everything that was established, our, our, uh, our amendments, our constitution, everything related back to God because our founding fathers really believed in God. But it seems as if we, like the children of Israel, are not learning from any past mistakes. It seems like we are treading down that same path of maybe not setting up idols per se, a golden image or a silver image or a stone image, but we have so many idols in this land that we are actually kneeling down in front of and we are worshiping. I even thought about the fact that just recently, in 1940s, we uh, experienced the Nazi regime and we've experienced uh, socialism by seeing that. And yet, what are we doing in this country? We're pulling it. We still just do not learn from past mistakes or past errors. I don't know why, but we're not doing that. And we're finding out that the children of Israel are just a lot like that, that no matter what's going on, they are not learning from God's, um, God, any mistakes that they have made. Although God has, and I, I think this is the overall theme of first Kings, second Kings, and all the Kings. Time after time after time, God is still wooing them back to himself. Uh, they've disgraced him. They've worshipped idols. They've forsaken the temple, forsaken godly worship. But God still, in his mercy, in his compassion, starts wooing them back. And he does this by setting every now and then a good, what we call a good king, or a king that would return them back. And today's lesson is a little bit about that because God is going, we're going to peek in, so to speak, at a, at a king who has made some reforms to bring them back. But if you've been studying with us in Kings, you've got to be excited about it. This has been like story time, hasn't it? Every lesson has been full of stories. Last week was no exception. Terry did such a wonderful job with that. Uh, the story there of the siege of Jerusalem and how they all got together and the lepers and all that was such a wonderful story. And today is again another story, but I'm going to give you just a tiny bit of background information on that. Um, and I know that a lot of you think, I don't even care about these kings or these names, but it does good to at least get a bird's eye view, a little bit of this perspective, what we're doing and what we're doing today. Most of our lessons have been centered around the north, the northern Israel. We talked about King Ahab, we talked about King Ahaziah, Joram, Jehu, these were lessons. And one lesson, it was actually the lesson that Scott took, taught you, we jumped back down to Israel, or Judah, and we talked about King Asa. Well, we're going to today, we're going to center around the south again. We're jumping from northern Israel down, and our lesson's going to be centered around the south. But in that is weaved um, a point of a story that I hope that I'll be able to get to here. I put some dates and some names up there on the board. Um, Ahab was a king in the north. His son, then his son, 
But Jehu, now you need to notice that a little bit because Jehu is going to come into play in our lesson today. Jehu was not a family descendant. If you remember, he was a captain of the army and he was so disgusted with everything and all the kings and all the evil that he overthrew and actually these, these chapters that are in between last week's lesson and our lesson today talks about how Ahab was killed, how Jezebel was killed, and how Jehu went through and killed every descendant of Ahab. So he did not follow in this descendant's line. Jehu is somebody else. But down in the south, it's not that way. They have, it's, it's, and the reason that it is not that way, I want to draw your attention to two verses of scripture. And one of them right now, um, I'll, I'll look, it's in 2 Kings chapter 11. Well, I'll, I'll, I have that in my notes later. But anyhow, this is the. I'm just going to give it to you now, and then I'll refer it to you later. God made this covenant with David. He said, "You will never, ever cease to have one of your descendants set on your throne." Keep that in mind because we're going to talk about that. But let me go back a little bit and give you a little bit of background here about this lesson. Here, it gets kind of confusing. Jehoiam. Is, a, is the king in about 853. Now, Jehoiam married, I wrote that down here, he made an allegiance at that time with the northern kingdom, Israel. And one of the things that he did, he did it by marrying Ahab's daughter, whose name is Athaliah. Do you see that on the bottom? Okay, you got that. You, this Because this is going to set up our lesson today. So Jehoiam, Jehoram, I get these mixed up here too, um, they, he was killed and, and you can read about how all that happened in um, cha the chapters in between there. He was killed and so his son was going to take over the kingship. Now, it's usually the oldest son, but since they were in, he got killed in a war with the Philistines. And the Philistines killed all of his sons except the youngest one, whose name was Amos As Azariah. Now, this was a daughter, a son of Jehoram and King Ahab's daughter, Athaliah. So you've got now Az Azariah living and ruling. Um, he didn't last very long because he also was killed. He was actually killed by Jehu. Uh, Second Chronicles, let me just real quickly give you this. Second Chronicles um, chapter, um, let's see, 21, verses 16 through 18. Let me just read this, and this might give you, I can give you a bird's eye view of this. You need to go back. It says, the Lord aroused against Jehoram, the hostility of the Philistines and all of the Arabs who lived near the Cushites. They attacked Judah, invaded it, and carried off all the goods found in the king's palace together with their sons and their wives. Not a son was left except Azariah, the youngest. In the course of time, Oh, it, after this, the Lord afflicted Jehoram with an incurable disease of the bowels. In the course of time, and at the end of the second years, his bowels came out because of the disease, and he li lived, he died in great pain. His, his people made no fire in his honor as they did for his fathers. Now Jehoram was 32 years old when he became king and he reigned in Jerusalem for eight years. Listen to this. He passed away to no one's regret and was buried in the city of David, but not in the tombs of the king. Now if you take down to the next chapter, which is 2 Chronicles chapter 22, verse 1, the people of Jerusalem made Azariah, Jehoram's youngest son, king of, in his place. Since the raiders 
who came with the Arabs had killed all the older sons. So as a uh, as uh, Ahaz, I don't have a terrible time with this, Azariah, son of Joram, began to reign. He was 22 years when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem. This isn't unique, one year. In case you thought I made a mistake because I put 841 and 841. He reigned one year. His mother's name was Athaliah, a granddaughter of Omri, which is back up here to. Ahab's father, <laughs> okay, um, for his mother, he, uh, he too walked in all the ways of the house of Ahab, Ahaziah, for his mother encouraged him to do wrong. He did evil in the sight of the Lord as the house of Ahab had done. So, I'm going to skip it a little bit down a little bit further. <clears throat> verse 7 here, or verse 8, while Jehu... King of the north was executing uh, judgment on the house of Ahab. He found the princes of Judah and the sons of Ahaz's relatives, Ahaz, Ahaziah's relatives, and his men captured him while he was hiding in Samaria. He was brought to Jehu, put to death. They buried him, for they said, he was a son of Jehoshaphat who sought the Lord with his whole heart. So in other words, he was a descendant of David. So there was no one in the house of Ahasariah powerful enough to retain the kingdom. That is setting up. Did you know what I said when I read that? Let me just point this out real quickly to you. Lines of David. But what he did was marry Ahab's daughter, they had a son, Ahaziah. Jehu up here was now killing off all of Ahab's descendants, which made him one of the descendants since the mother was up here. So he killed him. And so he only reigned eight, one year, or died in the year of his first reign. Now, the Bible said there was no one left in David's descendant line since they were all killed off, and since he died, to now reign. So guess who began to reign? Queen Athaliah. Now that's where our lesson takes up today, because as soon as Athaliah began her reign, her main goal was to kill off all, any descendants in the royal house. Any descendants might have anything of David's line, in him whatsoever and so she began to do this you know i wrote this down and i know you know this but this is amazing ever since god said i will have a son of david and he is going to reign forever and ever and ever and the prophecy being made that jesus himself a son of david would be born literally and it would be he would be placed on that throne I wrote some of these verses down. Um, in 2 Samuel chapter 7, it says, the whole chapter says this, but it says, God will establish the throne of David forever. The last descendant to reign will be Jesus Christ, who is the son of David, whose lineage is very meticulously recorded for us in Matthew chapter 1, Luke chapter 3, that actually tells us that Jesus Christ was a descendant of David through both his mother's line and his uh, legal father's line, who was Joseph. Now in 2 Kings, this is the one I was referring you to, in chapter 8 it is, in verses 19. 2 Kings chapter 8, verse 19. It just says this, Nevertheless, for the sake of his servant David, the Lord was not willing to destroy Judah. He had promised to maintain a lamp for David and his descendants forever. God made this promise from the very beginning of time that I am going to send my son and he is going to rule and reign from Jerusalem.
Jerusalem. He's going to sit on the throne of David. So thus, David's line is going to continue up into Jesus Christ. Can you not see how Satan's working and working and working? He, he from the very beginning of time, he killed Abel, which was a descendant. He, he just, like, um, is working to destroy God's promise, God's covenant. And today it's going to be really a unique way that God kept his promise because what had happened was um, Athaliah started killing off every, it just written in the royal palace, of every cousin, of every, any kind of a lineage of David at all. And she had them all killed. But in our lesson today, in chapter 12, 11, which is in your text, there's a person else that's going to show up. And I want you to look at this in chapter 11, verse 2. Well, let me just say, let's read the first verse 2. When Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, saw that her son was dead, she proceeded to kill or destroy the royal family. Here's, enter somebody else here. But Jeho, Jehosheba, now that's a lady, that's a girl, and look who it is. It's the daughter of King Jehoram and a sister of Ahaziah. Now whether she was a full-bred sister or a half-sister, I don't know. I, I'm not sure about that. But there was one remaining descendant of David left. And it was a small boy, a young babe. And it just so happened that this woman, Je Jehosheba, was married to a priest called Jehoiada. That's verse 4. Okay. So here's what she did. The sister of Ahaziah took Joash, son of Ahaziah, and stole him away from among the royal princesses who were about to be murdered. She put him and his nurse in a bedroom to hide them from Athaliah so he was not killed. And where would she ever find a place to hide him that wicked queen Ahab's daughter wouldn't find him? Do you read? Bedroom. Huh? In the bedroom. In the bedroom of a temple. <laughs> Look at that. He was remained hidden with his nurse at the temple of the Lord for six years while Athaliah ruled the land. <laughs> Amazing. I never thought to work, look at the temple, right? I don't think she ever entered the temple because what she did, and you can take it in your book of uh, Chronicles, and you can find out that she instituted the Baal worship, brought it down. She was Ahab's daughter. She instituted it, um, kind of like locked up the temple, although the priests were still there. She didn't lock it up. The priests were still doing there. But the majority of the people, felt led by the, this political power, worshipped Baal and set up all the Baal worship in Israel. Well, the story goes on that for seven years, Joash was hid by Ahaziah's son, which would have really been a grandmother, <laughs> his grandmother was trying to kill him. Now, whether it was uh, the biological line, at least it was through the father. Okay, so in, interesting. There he was there. So in the seventh year, and, and if you look over in our lesson today, which is not in your book, but you'll have to look over on um, chapter 12. Um, Well, I, oh, okay, anyhow, yeah, no, go back to, I'm sorry, to 11 chapter 4, because it says in the seventh year of this boy's life, okay, this is what happened, and this is just background material for yours. In the seventh year of Jehoiada, who is the priest, if, you, if I, I'm in chapter 11, 2 Kings chapter 11, verse 4, what he did, and I'm going to summarize this, he decided that, um, it's time for Joe Ash to be crowned king. Seven-year-old boy. This is, this is amazing. 
but he had taught him, he had schooled him in there. He had uh, taught him the ways of God. He was the priest. It was his uncle and his aunt that were raising him in the temple. And they were schooled him in this way. So, but what had happened was he decided now in the seventh year of this Athaliah's reign that it was time now. So if you can scan that, what he really did, he called a bunch of armies together and commanders together and said, you know what, you, we're, we're gonna set this big huge guard out here because for this protection, we're gonna have secret service, so to speak. We're gonna have CIA officers, we're gonna have all the army guard come out here because it's now time to reveal that God has kept his promise that Athaliah thought she had killed the descendants of David off, but there's one surviving boy who is the king, and we're going to bring him out and crown him. So chapter 11 sort of tells you that. Um, let's see. Verse 10 says, Then he gave the commanders the spears and the shields that had belonged to King David that were in the temple of the Lord. The, the guards, each one with a weapon in his hand, stationed themselves around the king near the altar of the temple from the south side to the north side of the temple. Verse 12, Jehoiada brought out the king's son and put a crown on him presented him with a copy of the covenant and proclaimed him as king. They anointed him and the people clapped their hands and shouted, long live the king. Now, verse 13, Athaliah heard all this noise. What's going on? And when she came back and found out there's a king there, a boy king, a descendant of David, she started screaming treason, 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 but nobody listened to her. And I'll uh, Jehoiada commanded that she be put to death. Verse 16, so they seized her as she reached the place where the horses entered the palace ground, and there she was put to death. So our story now is there's no one left to rule and reign over Judah but Joash around the year 835, and he is a boy king. Now, the boy king, it says the scriptures, if you go back to Chronicles, which I don't have the time to go, it tells us that he, he reigned for 40 years. He did what was right in the sight of God. He did it because of the training he had. He was trained by the priest, and he was trained by his aunt, and he lived in the temple. He watched the daily sacrifices. He watched everything that was going on. He heard the reading of the scrolls. He heard everything that was going on, and he did right. Now, he made some reforms, but on the contrary, which I hope we have time to get to at the end, towards the end of his life, after Jehoiada, the, pro the priest, his uncle, died, he reverted back and he started Baal worship again. It's just like, they never learn, they never understand, they never fully appreciate. But today's lesson's gonna be talking about how the good that he did. And one of the things that he did was, he instituted a reform or a remodeling, a, a repair of the temple. Now the temple had been in operation about 125 years. So there were things that were needing repair. The stonework, some of it had chipped out, the, the woodwork in there, all kinds of things needed repair. And it's sort of amazing that, um, or even in 2 Chronicles chapter 24, verse 7, it tells us that many items from the temple were confiscated and taken away. And here's what it says in 2 Chronicles chapter 24, verse 7. The sons of the wicked queen mother of the of, of, Athaliah had broken into the temple of God and used even its sacred objects for Baal worship. So all of this temple was deter deteriorated. Um, none of these kings ever did any kind of repair work to this temple. So in chapter uh, 24, 2 Chronicles, verse 4, sometimes later, Joash decided to restore the temple. So what he did first was he called all the priests from all the different towns of Judah, and he said, what we're going to do, we're going to collect money. Uh, we're going to collect it, and as the money comes in, I want you priests to do some temple repair. 
Now, that takes you over to page 93 of your booklet. And it's called The Problem. Well, the problem you can already know is the temple needed repair. So what they did, verse 4 of your lesson today says, Then Joash said to the priest, All the dedicated silver that's being brought to the Lord's temple, this is for their offerings that they're bringing in, and it names the different offerings. It says the census silver, and if, you're, if you read down your book, that's, that's like an annual tax, like we pay, an annual tax. A head of the house was censored, censored so much money, and they had to, uh, there was their obligation to bring it to the temple. So the te we're going to take the silver from the census. We're going to take silver from the vows. That means like if you make a vow to God, you always confirm that vow by presenting an offering or money and some description to, to God to confirm your vow. And also it says the next one for that, which is voluntarily given. So you take all of this, and each priest is to take it from the assessor. And I thought that was interesting. I didn't really, couldn't figure out what an assessor really meant. I knew what our assessor was and what they do. But at that time, if you read a little bit later on in your booklet, it'll tell you there, there was no actual coins yet. And so each piece of silver had to be examined and weighed to find its value. And so this is what this assessor did is the people would bring silver and assessor, that was their job, the temple job, was to take this silver, weigh it, and figure out the value of it. So they were going to take this, and what the report, what the uh, job that Joe Ash says, look at that, and repair whatever damage is found in the temple. Okay, the problem is the temple needed repair. Um, so they started gathering money, and the money came in really good. Um, and they had money to do it. But this is, look at verse 6. But by the 23rd year of the reign of King Joash, the priest had not repaired the damage to the temple. Wow. I don't know what year he gave that rule out, but by the 23rd year of his reign, the damage was never. I don't know what the problem was. I don't know why they didn't uh, solve that. Maybe they were just busy doing other things. Uh, maybe they didn't really see things to be repaired. Some people can go into a house and they can see it, and now the people say, oh, you yeah, know, it's okay, or whatever. So they didn't, they didn't do the repair. And I, I even think of um, maybe they just... Bob and Terry will appreciate this because I, and of course I'm very biased, but I think my husband Dick did a wonderful job in preparing messages and delivering them. I think he did a wonderful job in financially bringing the church together, but you know what? You don't ever put a hammer in his hand, did you? <laughs> no, it just didn't work. And everybody knew that. Don't, don't let Dick have a hammer. So maybe that is what this priest was all about. They had their ability, they had their talents, and just repair work just wasn't one of those. And so that was way down on their scale, or way down on that. Or um, maybe one of them did hit their thumb with a hammer. I'm not sure how that is. But anyhow, the work did not get done. So now the next thing is another solution is going to come. Um, so looking ahead in your booklet there, verse 7, so the king called jo Joash, called the priest, which is an uncle, Jehoiada, and said to the priest, why haven't you, why haven't you repaired the temple? That's in the end of that verse. So the priest agreed that they would receive no silver from the people, and they would not be the ones to repair the temple's damage. So that problem that was accessed, and it just didn't work out that way, the temple guys uh, it seemed like they um, weren't the people to repair it. It just wasn't getting done at all. So over on page 94 of your booklet, um, that was the problem. You see that down under verses 6, 8, the problem developed with Joe Ash's plan. And so we're going down here to another solution. Another solution was this in verse 9, page 94. Then the priest Jehoiada, Jehoiada the, took a chest. He bore a hole in the lid and set it beside the altar on the right hand side as one enters the temple. The priest guarded um, that money and that threshold in that chest um, where all the silver was brought into the Lord's temple, verse 16 or verse 10. Whenever they saw there was a large amount of silver in the chest, 
And this shows you how willingly the people gave. It's amazing. It reminds me of this activity building when we started building that. Some of you that were here on that, it was just amazing how the money came in. I mean, just from everywhere. I remember one of Dick's business acquaintances in Charleston who didn't even you know, know he gave like $1,000 just out of his pocket. I think that's a good cause. We're going to do that. So the money just came in. And this is the way it was here. God, this was God's idea, and money came in. It says a large amount of silver in the chest. So then the king's secretary or the king's royal uh, accountant himself, the king's secretary, he was in charge of it this time, and he would take it, it says, he would bag it up, and he would tally the silver found in the Lord's temple. Then they would give the weight silver to those doing the work, those who oversaw the Lord's temple. They would in turn pay it out to those working on the temple. And this time, they got smart. They got carpenters, builders, yeah. mason workers, and stone cutters. And they would use it to buy timber and, timber and quarry the stone for repair the damage of the Lord's temple for all the expenses of the temple. Well, that kind of uh, really just tells us too that each one of us do have a responsibility. We have a talent uh, in, in, and God has given to each one of us a different ability. And I'm glad that we all don't have the same one because that would be awful. Or I'm glad that we have different ones so that the work of the church, and that's the way it even is in the work of the church. We hit on that a little bit on Wednesday night when we talked about um, God-given talents and abilities to each person um, differently. So find out your ability, find out your talent, find out what God has given to you and use it for God's work because God so uniquely places in a, in a congregation not all, everybody with the same talent, which is great. Uh, we don't all play the piano. We're not all choir director. We're not all teachers. But God has placed it there. And not one uh, a position is any better than another because God has given to you that. And no matter what it is, and if it looks lowly in your sight, don't, don't let it that way because that's what God gave to you. And you need to do it with all your will and everything that you have to put into doing that. Well, uh, that was the solution that uh, he has. And in verse uh, 97, here was the action that was being taken, the last couple verses. However, no silver bowls, wick trimmers, sprinkling bases, trumpets, or any articles of gold or silver were made for the Lord's temple from the contributions brought to the Lord's temple. Instead, it was given to those doing the work. And they did repair the Lord's temple with it. No account, this is amazing too, no accounting was required from it, from the men who received the silver to pay those doing the work since they worked with, what's that word? Integrity. Integrity. They didn't even have to check up on these people. They didn't even have to uh, have them sign in and sign out and, and listen because they just were so, with so, so much integrity that they would be trusted, they were honest, and they did the work. So this sounded like this was the best plan there, wasn't it? It says the silver from the guild offering and the sin offering was not brought to the Lord's temple since it belonged to the priest. What you know there is there's so, that's how God provided for the priest. That certain offerings were given directly to the priest. That's how he lived. That's how he bought his food. That's how he got his clothes. That was his employment so that. Uh, so that is sort of like um, the integrity involved in there. Now, I'm, and it's time to close. I'm going to give you what I, what did, what can we learn from this text, or how can we apply it? Now, page 99 of your books will give you a couple ideas, and I've added to that. Page 99, it says, leaders are accountable for their actions. No doubt in my mind that God checks. He has a ledger, and he does check. And we are accountable to God. We are accountable when he gives us a position to uphold that position and it, with integrity. And no matter what we do, we, we, we are accountable to God. We are accountable, even if you're a church officer, you're accountable to the church, but you are, first of all, accountable to God for how you do that. So the Bible tells us in another portion of Scripture that whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. So no matter where you're working, and that's a good thing to even take to work if any of you are still in the business world at all. I'm not working for them. 
I'm working for God. And it takes a completely different aspect on the integrity of your job when you're the, I'm not working for Mrs. So-and-so or Mr. So-and-so, I'm working for God. And this is sort of what we see played out in front of us. They were working for God, so there was no need to check up on them and no need for that. Well, the second one in your book says, God expects his people to take care of their financial obligations. And the financial part of that did come out where uh, the offerings that were due, the census that were due, God does demand um, that we support his work, just like this temple. They paid the temple priest. God says your financial um, obligations there. And the third one says a believer's integrity in business can further the case of God's kingdom. And that is so true. Um, if you have a business, people look at you and they see how you run your business and that's where that word integrity comes in. I added a couple more on there. And I put number four was choose wisely who you will allow to influence you. Joash was influenced by Jehoiada, the, the priest. And it, it worked out really good for him. He was born, he was raised, he was trained. Now if I could tell you the rest of the story real quickly, and you'll find this in your Bible, Jehoiada, the priest, dies when he's 130 years old. Joash, in turn, when he died, abandoned the temple worship and he went back to the idols. I told you that in the previous. He went back to Baal. Now Jehoiada and uh, the, her daughter's name, jo Joashiba, had a, had a son and his name was Zachariah. Not the Zachariah in the Bible, but a son named Zachariah. Zachariah took up on his father's footsteps. And when he saw Joash go back after Jehoiada died, he said, he started speaking out very loudly about it. Remind me of John the Baptist, actually. Remember when John the Baptist went into the king and said, hey, you're not doing this right. You're living with your brother's wife. And he was very plain and outspoken. Well, Zachariah was very plain and outspoken to him. And guess what he did? He had this king's son had that uh, priest son killed. They stoned him to death. Can you imagine the backwards? So be careful who you let influence you because it was great when he allowed the priest to influence him. But then after the priest died, all these other people started coming in and influencing him. And he listened to them went back to worship and actually killed the son of the priest. The Bible says, if we keep on going and reading, it says God, God took note of this, and he says this, for this act you will be severely punished. Very soon he was wounded in battle. This is the king, Joash, and in his bed, this is in 2 Chronicles chapter 12, 21, verses 23 and 25, so here it will say, he was wounded in battle, they carried King Joash to his bed, and people came in, his, uh, his officials came in and murdered him in his bed. Done with King Joash now. Well, my fifth one says God, and I already talked about this, God is faithful to his promise. Who or how would you ever think that there was a little boy that God preserved in the temple? It looked like God had forsaken his promise that he had made to David. And it looked like Satan had the victory, stamping out King David's reign the descendant, thus stopping the Lord Jesus Christ to be born in the household of David. But God mysteriously, uniquely preserved the life of this small child in the temple, hidden for seven years. Well, my next one says, God will not tolerate idolatry. Now, we probably don't have any place, oh, there are some shrines I've seen throughout the United States, but it's not a national shrine that we all go and worship Buddha or worship some of these idols. But God says, I won't tolerate idolatry. He won't. We've seen this play out in front of us. Idolatry is just anything that any of us personally place at a higher level in our life than God. That's what it is. 
No matter what it is, if we t let it take a stance over God in our life, and we could start naming, it could be relationship, it could be money, it could be possessions, it could be um, your your personality, your what you seek for happiness, what you seek for joy, and on and on that list could go that we but God, look at this lesson. God will not tolerate idolatry and much more in someone who claims to be his child. So it gives us, um, looking at history, let's learn from it. Number seven is incomplete obedience. Leaves room for temptation. What did I say? Incomplete obedience leaves room for temptation. What did Joash do? He made, started to make reforms. What he did was he, he smashed down all Baal worship. But the Bible, if you read it closely, he said he didn't smash some of the high places. He left the people still there. And so by letting the people go up to the high places that was accustomed to doing that, he repaired the temple for that short time. He left the high places. He smashed down Baal, but he left room for temptation to come in. And pretty soon when his spiritual influence died, Satan came in. He fell for temptation and then reconstituted the Baal worship. My last one is we all make choices every day, every day, and we are accountable to God for those choices. Hopefully you've learned a little bit from Joe Ash, not to get mixed up with Josiah, who's going to come later and repair the temple again and find scrolls uh, and going to say, oh, we are not keeping any of these. But this is Joash. I know you're not going to remember. You won't be able to pronounce it. Maybe you can, but I can't. Carrie and I both have problems with this <laughs> pronunciation. So it's not really important, you know, but you know the gist of it. You know the history of, of Judah now. What we did today, we skipped from the north down to the south, and we're talking about the kings of the south. And it's going to climax. It's going to climax with the north and 723, which is not too far from 841, going into a captivity by the Assyrians, their land destroyed, overtaken, and then a couple good kings come and bring the south back to God, and in 586, uh, they are destroyed by the power of Babylon. So it's, it's amazing, and it's a great study, but you've got to read 1 Kings, 2 Kings, and 1 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles, to kind of get all the information there. Hope God has been able to speak something to you uh, and that you'll be able to take with you this week.